Hello everybody, it's Martin Harvey here. Uh, thanks for joining the meeting. And uh, what we're going to do today is talk through some of the background to medicines use in podiatry and then some of the, uh, the current things that apply to us, the things that we can do and the things that we can't do as well. I hope you'll find it interesting. I'm going to switch to a screen share now. which should be happening as we speak. Right, so medicines and the podiatrist. It's a relatively complex area. It's changed a lot over the years. You know, one time, certainly if you go back to the, uh, to the mid 20th century, then really medicines use was um, confined to stuff that you could just buy over the counter. It's obviously a lot different now. I mean, I certainly remember my aunt and my mother's chiropody surgery from the 1950s. And uh, you've got things like coating bends, you've got some hydrogen peroxide and a few other bits and pieces, but that seemed to be as much as they'd got in the way of medicines. Um, that's me, obviously. <clears throat> For those that don't know me, I am an independent and a supplementary prescriber. I work at a couple of hospitals and a health center in, in and around Birmingham. My particular interest is in dermatology and injection therapies. Once again, some of you may know me from teaching uh, steroid injections, platelet-rich plasma injections, and similar dermal fillers. So, UK laws on medicines. Well, there's been some UK laws on medicines, certainly since the time of Henry VIII and possibly before. I would imagine that those laws weren't really designed to look out for the public. They were probably designed to ensure that the king got a share of uh, the taxes that were coming off them. And really, until the mid-19th century, there wasn't much in the way of legislation around. In the 19th century, there was a big, big opium problem, opium addiction, and other opioids, opioid derivatives such as laudanum um, in the... UK as well as many parts of the world and uh, that was sought to be addressed uh, with the 1886 Pharmacy Act which um, we tried to reverse the situation all these numerous drug dens that they had scattered around the country very frequently in ports because it was easy to bring the uh, drugs in obviously by sea but uh, nothing much happened after that until the 1908 Act 1908, sorry, uh, and that moved opioids and some derivatives of opioids with uh, greater than 1% uh, morphine content into the poisons schedule, part one. And if you look at the poison schedule, then really the main medicines that were addressed in there were opioids and derivatives, and the rest of them were what we would often regard as poisons today, hence the name. Um, in 1920, the Dangerous Drugs Act um, revisited this area it was amended again in 1923 once again mainly addressing opioids and uh, cannabis was mentioned in this as well because up until that point in time uh, one of the things that was popular in chiropody was uh, cannabis ointment which apparently i've never used it myself but apparently it was quite good on a neurovascular corn or some other nasty things like that on the foot but uh, its use was after 1923 controlled at that point in time as well, in UK law, addiction itself was made a criminal offence that you could do jail time over. So the thing was much more on uh, punishment rather than treatment in those days. And because of that, because it was a criminal offence, the regulation of controlled drugs was moved into the area of the Home Office. And it's still the Home Office now in 2020 that uh, controls controlled drugs. In 1933, you had the Pharmacy and the Poisons Act expanded, uh, so they added more poisons, they added a few medicines, benzocaine, for example, which I'm assuming is benzocaine, that we'd understand it now. Um, possibly in uh, response to the fact that there were some quite high-profile poisoning cases uh, at the start of the 1930s. There was a very famous one in Hay on the uh, borders of Wales, where a solicitor called Armstrong <clears throat> had fallen out with his wife. So he went to the local chemist and he said, oh, I'd like some uh, 
I'd like some arsenic, please. And the chemist said, well, what's that for, Mr. Armstrong? And he said, oh, it's to kill the dandelions in the front garden, don't you know? So he was duly given a great big packet of arsenic. He took it home and he killed his wife with it, for which he was subsequently hanged. Uh, so possibly that might have been a case that uh, decided them to expand the Pharmacy and Poisons Act. But still, once again, there is a preponderance of what we'd regard as poisonous substances. Phenol, of course, which we don't know, well, that stands outside medicines completely. That does formaldehyde, caustic soda, mercurochrome, many other mercury-based medicines were around at that time, so they were trying to control those as well. Because as we know nowadays, mercury is quite a dangerous stuff to uh, play around with. The first comprehensive legislation was actually passed in 1968 with the 1968 Act. Um, its reason for being was often ascribed to the thalidomide drug tragedy. Now, I've got a later slide on that. We'll look at that in a slightly more detail. But what the 1968 Act tried to do was to draw together all the strands of medicines and drugs. So it tried to draw together manufacturing, laboring, sales, storage, supply, who could supply it, where they could supply it, when they could supply it, all under one roof, so to speak. Um, it obviously wasn't a perfect act because until the next act came out in 2012, which is the one that we run under now, Medicines for Human Use Regulations, the 1968 Act had over 30 very substantial amendments and it was quite a stack of legislation that uh, was probably confusing to a number of people, uh, not least me. So uh, the 2012 Act, now we come to that, um, that's quite a comprehensive um, quite a comprehensive set of regulations. It's the um, medicine, medicinal products for human use, and it covers manufacture, import, distribution, sales, supply, labeling, advertising, and also the overarching vigilance of it, pharmacovigilance. It also implements a European directive as well. Now, how that will stack up in the future with European directives, nobody particularly knows at the moment. A strong possibility, perhaps, is that the the any directives european directives will just be brought into law to make us uh, you know concurrent with with european law on on drugs because all countries in the world have a drug problem the uh, the policing agency so to speak um of these regulations is for normal medicines the medicines and healthcare products regulation agency i don't know what happened to the p I've always thought it should be the MHPRA, but MHRA is uh, referred to now. And thalidomide in the late 1950s and the early 1960s was a drug that was rushed to market quite quickly as a miracle drug, as a miracle drug to actually control morning sickness uh, in pregnant ladies. Um, and if any of you have um, either had morning sickness yourself or and you're a good lady with morning sickness, then you'll know that, that that can be quite an uncomfortable thing. So it became a very popular drug very quickly. The only problem was it wasn't policed very well, and perhaps it wasn't developed to the extent it should have been developed. And it did cause some very unpredictable and some very, very severe, serious birth defects that some people, some unfortunate people, are still living with these days. Sometimes they were born without arms, they were born without legs, they were born with other parts of their limbs missing, and so on and so forth. So it was a wake-up call, and it was a wake-up call that the media, of course, in those days jumped on, because then, of course, unlike previous times, we've got television, radio, newspapers that were feeling their feet. So the government was essentially embarrassed into setting up a response to it. And what they set up in response was the Committee on the Safety of Drugs in 1963, and uh, that eventually was the organisation that implemented the 1968 Act and introduced it. The Committee on the Safety of Drugs went through several name changes. It was at one time the Medicines Control Agency back a few years ago. Uh, but now it is the MHRA, changed to the MHRA in 2003. They've got a comprehensive website if you want to have a look at it. <clears throat> what we'll look at in this talk is the legal categories of medicines in the UK. So we'll look at medical devices, which is a rather confusing area. GSL, which stands for General Sales List. P, which stands for Pharmacy-Only Medicines, Prescription-Only Medicines, and Control Drugs.
And of course, we'll look at it from the podiatry perspective. So we'll look at what we as podiatrists can utilize, what we can prescribe, if we prescribe us, what we can sell, what we can supply, what we can administer, how we can administer it, and so on and so forth. We'll also look at sources of information on medicines, uh, because there's some good sources of information out there and some bad sources of information. Well, obviously, it's our clinical responsibility to use the good sources, and uh, we'll just cover those as well. Medical devices. Now, this is a busy slide, isn't it? So I don't propose to read all of it out. But essentially, a medical device is an article intended for a medical purpose, but is not actually a medicine. So it could be a pair of gloves, it could be a set of crutches, it could be a wheelchair, and so on and so forth. Confusingly, though, you can also have um, things that we would think of possibly as medicines. Because some of you may use um, hyaluronic acid products like Ostinil, which is a visco supplement lubricant that you can uh, inject into uh, cranky joints to help them a little bit, hopefully. Uh, and also, of course, there are hyaluronic acid based injections that can augment tissue. Certainly, they can be used for cosmetic purposes, which aren't our remit, but they can be used to augment the tissue of the foot if there's, a, if there's some kind of over plantar pressure there that you need to ameliorate a bit. You can sometimes rejuvenate the tissue underneath to make it a little, little more friendly. Uh, and yet, strangely enough, those are medical devices at the moment. There's even one of them that contains lidocaine. It's still a medical device at the moment. So that's quite confusing. Um, obviously, medical devices cover diagnostic devices as well. In vitro, medical devices are being used in our lab. They come under that as a medical device as well. So at the current time, I would imagine that the uh, COVID-19 testing kits hopefully are medical devices as well. Let's hope they work well. Now, let's look at the categories of medicines in a little more detail. So general sales list, GSL medicines I mentioned, they can be bought from the supermarket, for example, uh, without the supervision of any health professional or a pharmacy or anything. The only conditions with a GSL medicine is that the premises it's sold from must be capable of being locked when it's unattended. And that's it. They're medicines essentially that are regarded as being intrinsically safe. Although naturally, of course, some of them can be misused, but their misuse is not as, uh, not as great a potential as a true uh, medicine, a pharmacy medicine, or prescription mm -hmm. medicine, or a controlled drug, certainly. Now, pharmacy medicines can only normally, and please note that word normally, and let's put a, an imaginary underlying under, under it, can be obtained from a pharmacy and sold under the supervision of a pharmacist. So, for example, if you walk in and you ask for a medicine that is a pain medicine, then the sales assistant might wave it vaguely in the direction of the pharmacist, and they'll nod, hopefully, and then they can sell it because they're supervising that sale. However, as with a lot of things that all run through this uh, presentation, there are exemptions to that. And the one exemption, of course, we're familiar with is the podiatrist's list of pharmacy medicines and the prescription only medicines we use as well. They can be supplied and used under an exemption. Um, prescription only medicines must normally be prescribed by a doctor or another qualified health professional, an independent prescriber or a supplementary prescriber. Once again, I'll highlight the differences between those two just to uh, revise on that. And the prescription should be on an NHS FP10, which is the familiar green prescription form, which nowadays is very often done electronically. And even in private medicine, we some of us, we use electronic prescriptions rather than written prescription. There are, once again, exemptions to this idea of prescription only medicine necessarily being on a, on a prescription. Then you have controlled drugs. Now, as I said, they're home office controlled drugs, so they stand outside the system a little bit. And they are covered by the supervision, controlled drugs, supervision, management and use regulations 2013, um, for example. Examples of controlled drugs are morphine, pethidine, methadone, certain types of codeine, although once again, there are types of codeine that can actually buy over the counter from a pharmacy. And uh, what makes them either a, 
a pharmacy only medicine or a prescription only medicine or a controlled drug is actually the strength of some of these substances that are in them. Uh, we won't go into that in detail, but as I say, there are exempted birth variations and we'll look at the exempted variations a little later. If you want to know everything about controlled drugs and you need a list of them, then if you look at uh, www w.gov.uk backslash government backslash publications backslash control dash drugs dash list dash two backslash then there's a full list of controlled uh, medicines on there there are much stricter legal controls on uh, on those on the way you can prescribe them and who you can prescribe them to who can prescribe them and do and it's ideally to prevent them from being misused to prevent them from being obtained illegally and to prevent them from causing harm. It is unfortunately a sad fact that a lot of the illegal drugs that are on the streets have actually originally come from a legal source and then somehow they've gone into the illegal uh, arena. Certainly no suggestions that that's coming from uh, prescribers, but there are various other ways that they can come. They can sometimes just be disposed of where they shouldn't be disposed of and they'll fall into the system. There's one thing on the streets I'm told at the moment, the, uh, the fentanyl boiler. Now fentanyl is a, an opioid patch that can be given to a person to, it's a transdermal delivery patch. So it can be given to a person for a moderate to severe pain and they can stick it on and hopefully over a period of 24, 48 hours it will deliver a dose of an opioid that will help their pain. But if those are disposed of, then they can be uh, scavenged from rubbish and similar, stuck in half a pint of boiling water, boiled up for 10 minutes, let it cool, and then you can use that as an injectable drug. Don't recommend it, because drugs like that, they are causing the, quite a substantial number of fatalities on the streets. Uh, but that's a slightly different, slightly different area. Drugs, controlled drugs are listed in various categories. So for example, you've got Schedule 2 to the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971 and Schedules 1 to 5 to the Misuse of Drug Regulations 2001. Our old friend Diazepam, otherwise known as Valium, um, is a Class C drug in uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act and it's a Schedule 4 Part 1 drug in the Misuse of Drugs Regulation. So often these drugs will fall into two different areas. Now, when we're administering drugs, um, the legislation itself doesn't specifically address the issue of administration, except where that product is for injection. Apart from, as I highlighted earlier, things like dermal fillers. Um, and that's not addressed because they're a medical device. They're not a medicine, rather strangely. But if it's a medicine and it's for injection, it should only be self-administered think of for example of a diabetic who has to administer insulin to themselves every day or administered by somebody who's officially allowed to administer it a doctor a dentist a prescriber or a statutorily exempted person or a health professional acting within pgd pgd stands for patient group direction and i'll go into those in a bit or by anyone acting in accordance with the patient specific direction psd or a doctor or a dentist or a prescriber who can give a patient specific direction to a person or persons. Patient group direction, this PGD is ideally a written instruction as per specific regulations for laying them out. So it says who can form them, who can't form them, so on and so forth. For the sale, the supply and or the administration of named medicines in an identified clinical situation and or location. So it might be groups of patients who are not individually identified before they're presenting for treatment. Imagine somebody walking into a, into a walk-in treatment center at a hospital, they've got a cut finger, they see the nurse, the nurse cleans the finger, she might put a, um, she might put a plaster on it, she might put a butterfly on it, she might put a stitch in it, something like that and then decide that uh, it would be a good idea to give them some antibiotic cover for it. So you can reach up to the shelf, give them a box of antibiotics <coughs> with the instructions already on them. And she may not be a prescriber, but she could be operating within a patient group direction set up by that particular trust. 
The only people who can implement a patient group direction in the way I've just described with that nurse are those health professionals in the bottom that you can see there. So nurses, physios, plants, prosthetists, orthotists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have to be some kind of specified registered health professional. And they have to have current professional registration as well. So if they're struck off today, they can't do it tomorrow, which applies to a lot of things with medicine. A patient-specific direction is PSD. That's a written instruction from a qualified and registered prescriber for a specific medicine to be supplied or administered to a named patient. So the director must include the dose, the route, the frequency. Just imagine a situation where um, somebody perhaps is receiving end-of-life care and their family is looking after them for the end of life and it might be necessary to give them um, injections of morphine or something to control excessive pain and some such. So a prescriber could have a patient-specific direction to administer that to granny you know, when she goes into pain as she comes towards the end of her life or something similar like that. So it's a legal setup and the prescriber themselves takes responsibility for that. PSD, so if something goes wrong, it's the prescriber's neck on the block, as it should be. Now we then come on to exemptions. Now exemptions are not prescribing, although current in the current day and age, it's pretty hard to uh, find a way to differentiate them from uh, prescriptions. Because exemptions are a range of statutory exemptions from the Medicines Act. So if there's an exemption in law for something, then a particular drug for a particular person or a particular purpose can step outside the Medicines Act and a person who should be a registered health professional can use that even though perhaps they cannot themselves um, write a prescription. A good example is POM-A and POM-S that we have in podiatry, for example. One deals with the, exact, with the administration of medicines, the other deals with the supply of medicines. And that's two very good, two very good examples of um, exemptions. Now, exemptions, of course, do differ from arrangements for patient group directions uh, because the latter uh, patient group directions must comply with specific legal criteria. Whereas if there's a blanket exemption for a medicine, then that's not the case. How do we in podiatry compare, talking of exemptions to the Medicines Act and other things with other professions? Now this is an updated list. And as you can see, we're here in podiatry. And if you look, we can uh, be part of a patient specific direction, a patient group direction. We have exemptions to the Medicines Act ourselves. Those of us who wish to do additional training can go on to train as a supplementary prescriber. We can also train as an independent prescriber and we do have access to certain controlled drugs either through a specific exemption or through being able to prescribe them from a specified list of controlled drugs or as a supplementary prescriber and I'll describe the difference between the two shortly. Um, from uh, a much more flexible area that doesn't go from a specific list and just has a few uh, things that you cannot prescribe in that. But if you compare this down the list, then you see that we actually tick more boxes and put X's in more boxes than any other profession. And physios are the only other profession on this list that can actually uh, access control drugs at the moment. Although I would imagine that um, there is a situation where paramedics must be able to access them, but um, whether that's gone into law and yet or not, I don't know. But as you can see, some uh, professional groups, they only have very, um, very, very limited access to medicines. So an arts therapist can have a patient specific direction or a biomedical scientist, for example, and nothing else, a clinical scientist, the same, a hearing aid dispenser. Uh, an operating department practitioner, which is perhaps rather surprising. A practitioner psychologist, once again, uh, and a social worker in England. 
Um, I don't have information on social workers in Wales and uh, Scotland. Uh, so you can see we've got quite a good bit of responsibility under the Medicines Act. And of course, those responsibilities come via annotations in podiatry. Now, if we look at our um, HCPC register, then we'll see that we have an annotation against our name, uh, with the exception of the top one, because there is a list of pharmacy only medicines that all registered podiatrists, even if they have no annotations against their name whatsoever, can purchase and supply. And that's a specific list. As you'll see when we look at it on the next slide, you'll see it's a very old list. But uh, nonetheless, there is a list there, and we'll look at a few examples of it. <clears throat> then there's the annotation of POM A, which allows us to administer a listed drug. There's a short list of drugs that we can do, mainly by chronocetics, but you've also got other ones on there. Then POM S, you can supply specified medicines once again from a list. And then you've got supplementary prescribing, where you can have a prescribing plan laid out with a medical doctor and the patient. And an independent prescriber then can prescribe all prescription medicines and some controlled drugs. Once again, they will have an IP annotation on the HCPC register. Now we come to the first one that I said, the rights of all registered podiatrists to sell or supply these P medicines. And there's some quite interesting ones on there. Some that you'll know, obviously, potassium permanganate, that uh, can, can be useful to make an explosive if you want, but for a medical reason, you use it for dermatological conditions in a very, very weak, um, very weak dilution. Uh, various ointments, heparinoid and hyaluronidase, they used to be used for, uh, for uh, phlebitis and things like that in the lower leg. And then some that you may not be quite so familiar with, glucosamide. Uh, uh, Protrimazole is quite a familiar one, that's still around, isn't it? As uh, Daclarin and things like that. Um, Fentipor, Glutaraldehyde, Hydrogarfin, um, Mycoconazole is still around. Uh, podophyllin, I don't know if anybody out there is using podophyllin. If you did, still are using it, you're very brave. Uh, many, 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 many years ago, I used it and managed to blow a hole in somebody's toe uh, because it's uh, quite a very caustic resin. Uh, Pyrogawal, polynoxylin, salicylic acid, we still have. Uh, Tabinophene, we still have, obviously, because that's, uh, that's an antifungal agent. Now, all of these, with the all of these are obviously a topical agent. We're not talking about something for internal use, with the exception of ibuprofen. And there you see that you can actually supply an amount sufficient for three days treatment, where the maximum dose is 400 milligrams per dose, and the maximum daily dose is 1,200 milligrams, and the maximum pack size that you can supply to them is 3,600. Um, ibuprofen is one of my favorite drugs anyway, because it does have quite a few suggestions that it's not very good for your tummy. Um, certainly it can, uh, it has been implicated in gastric bleeds and things like that. And currently, of course, in this current COVID-19 situation, we know that ibuprofen uh, can actually reduce the immune system in various ways. So it's not my favorite drug, but it is there on the list if you need to use it. Then we come to POMS. And for POMS, you can sell or supply these prescription only medicines. So, Codidromol, which actually contains an opioid, um, sufficient for three days treatment to a maximum of 24 tablets. Amorolphine hydrochloride cream, where the maximum strength doesn't exceed 25% weight in weight. Then, the lacquer, where it doesn't exceed 5% by weight in volume. Topical hydrocortisone creams, up to 1%, shouldn't exceed 1% weight in weight. Silver sulfur diazine, uh, that can be quite useful if you happen to have a burn or something. Uh, I was treated with that on one occasion when I had some uh, liquid nitrogen poured over my hand by a trainee GP in hospital. Long story, but uh, silver sulfur diazine after soaking my hand in uh, 
cold water for 15 minutes ensured that uh, I've still got my hand. So it's quite useful stuff. Then amoxicillin, erythromycin, fluvoxacillin. Amoxicillin and flucloxacillin, we're familiar with. We probably use flucox perhaps more than amox because amox is, uh, has a slightly different spectrum of action to flucox. Erythromycin is useful if somebody's got uh, a reaction or an allergy to uh, one of the penicillins. So that's an alternative that we can use. And of course, teoconazole, which is for male fungus, which allegedly works on male fungus. And then, of course, if you've got POM A against your name, we've got papivacaine, papivacaine with adrenaline, lignocaine, also with adrenaline, mapivacaine, good old scandinest, uh, prilocaine, adrenaline for injection, which it's been only been there for a few years, really. Um, rather perversely. Methylprednisolone injection, which is your steroid methylprednisolone acetate, of course, uh, Depomed. Uh, Levobipivacaine hydrochloride, another local anesthetic, and rapivacaine hydrochloride. Once again, the person must be a registered podiatrist. They must have a certificate of competence in that area, and it, the certificate must be issued by a recognized university, by a recognized course that's been recognized by the ACPC. And as with all of the medicines rights that I'm talking about, if a person was to be struck off today, then your medicines rights finish today. You have to have current registration in order to have any of these exemptions or any of these rights. It's the same with myself as an independent and supplementary prescriber. If I was uh, kicked off the register tonight as I'm talking to you, then uh, that's it, I can no longer prescribe anything at all for anybody that I saw tomorrow. Supplementary prescribers. At one time, of course, going back before 2010, the only type of prescriber that we could train to be in podiatry was a supplementary prescriber. Um, I did one of the early courses and it was perhaps fortunate. Well, it worked for me because I worked within a healthcare set setting where I was always next door to a doctor and I'd worked with this doctor for, for years and years and years. So if I wanted to supplementarily prescribe a drug, I literally just had to poke my head around the, around the door next door and agree a clinical management plan with that doctor and then I could write a prescription for a drug. But of course that didn't work for a lot of colleagues who may not have been in that situation. You know, especially if you've got your own practice, you're separate to other things. How are you going to put a clinical management plan together, which you need in order to be a supplementary prescriber? And that plan has to be agreed by the independent prescriber, in this case, a doctor. It has to be agreed by the patient that you want to prescribe for, and it has to be agreed by the supplementary prescriber. And then they can prescribe any medicines for the BNF and the children's BNF. They can prescribe on label, off label, and licensed drugs. And they can prescribe any schedule, two, three, four, or five controlled drugs, with the exception of dimorphine, cocaine, and dipropanone, which is used for the treatment of uh, addiction. So, yeah, it was a good idea, but in practice, it didn't tend to work as well as it hoped it would work. And that's why there was this movement towards independent prescribing, which we agitated for, as I'm sure some of you know in the profession. And I joined the Medicines Project in 20, 2009, I think. And we were on it for about two years. There was a committee of us, people from the Institute, people from the Society, as it was in those days, uh, people from universities, the pharma, pharmacological industry, the, um, and so on and so forth. And at the end of it, we had a plan that was acceptable to the, the Ministry of Health, and it went through. It wasn't a particularly easy thing to get through because there was some opposition to it and rather surprisingly the opposition tended to come from uh, the medical profession whereas there was a lot of support for the idea from every other organization the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, the Nursing and Mid Mid Midwifery Council etc very very supportive of it. A couple of the Royal Colleges of Medicine no the responses that they gave to the um, to the uh, consultations that we had to send out uh, were quite negative in certain instances. But nonetheless, it still went through and we were still able, once the law changed in 2010, 2011, to either 
train over from being a supplementary prescriber to being an independent prescriber by doing a short uh, course or to do a new course for new people coming into it and then they could train as an independent and supplementary prescriber. Because there are some instances where it can still be useful to be a supplementary prescriber. Although I have to say, in my own personal instances, I don't tend to use supplementary prescribing at all. Podiatrists and independent prescribers, they can prescribe any medicine for any medical condition. Interestingly enough, however, you have to be prescribing within your own level of knowledge and your own level of professional competence. So if I was prescribing something for somebody's bald head, then I could certainly be criticized for doing that. Uh, and also I will, I'm not really competent to, to prescribe for bald heads. Uh, so I would certainly lay myself open to criticism and possibly sanctions. So really we have to stick within our own area and prescribe things that affect our own area. But having said that, of course, any of the, most of the drugs that we prescribe, they don't only affect the feet, they affect the whole body. So that's why we have to be in a position and have the knowledge to assess a patient, a holistic assessment of the patient if we're gonna stick a drug in them. And uh, so we can prescribe on label or off label. Now that sometimes causes a bit of confusion. Drugs have labels of use essentially, it's called the summary of product characteristics. And that describes the drug and what it should be used for and so on and so forth. And that is its licensed use. Now, the off-label usage of a drug is to use it for something that perhaps it's not intended for, but provided that drug has a UK license, then if you're an independent prescriber, you can use it off the label, off the directions of that license. I'll give you an example. I do something, uh, and also teach something called prolotherapy which is well known in America and not that well known in this country. And there you use a mixture of local anesthetic and uh, glucose, injectable glucose, uh, and you can inject it into areas where there are stuck healing responses, so a damaged ligament that won't heal and something like that. And you can kind of jerk it sometimes back into a healing cascade. Um, now, of course, the licensed application of that glucose is to use for hypoglycemic conditions. Whereas I'm using it as part of a prolotherapy solution, actually as a mixed medicine, I'm using that um, for its off an off-label purpose. So in order to do that, I have to know what I'm doing. I have to be able to prove that in court if necessary, if it ever went that well. Uh, and also I have to take clinical responsibility for what I'm doing. Now, I've just mentioned there that I'm mixing two medicines together. Now that's something that a prescriber can do. It's not something that you can or should do if you are using your Medicines Act exemptions because you're making a new medicine. Uh, so that's just the way the law works at the moment. So as well as any medicine from the British National Formulary, which I'll cover in a minute, uh, we can also prescribe the following controlled drugs for oral administration. So diazepam, dihydrocodone, tartrate, as a, as a painkiller, which the body kind of makes into morphine. Lorazepam and temazepam. Lorazepam is good for conscious sedation uh, during the procedure, something like that. Temazepam, once again, is a relaxant and anxiolytic, and it does help them to sleep the night before if they're gonna have a procedure that they're a bit nervous about. So if you have the archetypal uh, patient who's absolutely terrified of having nail surgery the following day, um, I will usually, if they're in that bad a state and subject to it being appropriate for that particular patient, I might give them a prescription for two diazepam tablets. Take one Valium tablet uh, the night before and then take one two hours before you come to see me. And very often the most nervous patient will sit there with a smile on your face, on their face rather, as you uh, give them an injection of, um, of local anesthetic in their toe before you're gonna rip the toenail off. As it says there, Podiatrist independent prescribers must work within their own level of professional competence and expertise. And of course, that does vary from person to person because, you know, we very often go in different training areas and we go through our, through our career. In practice today, most podiatrist independent prescribers are also trained and annotated as SPs. So you'll see IP and SP usually. So if you look my name up, you'll see IP and SP. Now, we come to something very interesting. 
I'm sorry for that flicking around. Um, Schedule 19 medicines. Now, these are medicines, parenteral medicines, so it can be administered by injection, for administration in an emergency. And in an emergency, the law permits certain medicines to be administered by injection in an emergency in order to save life by a non-prescriber. Now, there's a list of these permitted medicines, and that's, we call them Schedule 19 because it's Schedule 19 of the Human Medicine Regulations 2012. And this exemption applies to anybody, regardless of their profession or no profession at all. If they are a registered person, of course, then the, registra the registration body would expect them to follow the policy that applies to them as a particular individual or, uh, or group of people or their employer. If they're in the NHS, really they should be following the instructions of their uh, NHS trust. But nonetheless, you might have a situation perhaps where you work on an oil rig. Somebody might have an accident, you don't have a doctor on the oil rig, you might have a very well-trained first aider but they may need to administer um, some uh, drug, for example, to control severe pain. Somebody might have lost a leg or something like that. So that would apply to Schedule 19, things like that. Um, they might be stung by a snake. That wouldn't happen on an oil rig, I don't assume, but they might be in the middle of the jungle. Once again, that would be a Schedule 19 situation if somebody had some... Uh, snake venom with them, some snake venom antiserum, injected them, they're not a prescriber, but fine, they can still use it because they've got the intent to save life. And there's the whole list there. Adrenaline, one to a thousand up to one milligram for intramuscular use in anaphylaxis. Uh, atropine sulfate and obidoxine chloride injection, that would be for nerve agents. So if you're in the armed forces and if you were attending some area where somebody had um, released a nerve agent, then atropine sulfate and obidoxamine, obidoxine comes in an auto-injector that you can actually inject through the leg of your nuclear and biological contamination suit uh, to save your life. And various other things down there you can see a whole lot. In the middle of there you can see naloxone. That is something that can be used in opioid overdoses. And you'll often find that people like police officers um, fire brigades, I think, certainly drug centers, drug dropping centers and things like that. They will often have naloxone on hand because they can pull somebody back from the brink of death if, if they've got an opioid overdose. Uh, a friend of mine who's a police officer says, however, be careful how you do that because they may sit up once they come around from the gates of death and then clag around the head because they were having the best trip of their lifetime. So uh, just be aware of that if you happen to use naloxone at any time. But that's your Schedule 19 drugs. Now, where can we get good sources of information? The best source of information, if ever you have to stand up in a court and defend your prescribing decisions, is the British National Formulary. It's published jointly twice a year by the British Medical Association and the RPS, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Uh, you can buy it from Amazon or from Book sellers and things like that. Fairly expensive now, I think it costs over 30 pounds in addition. Uh, quite useful. Um, I have them scattered around my clinics. Um, you have to hide them though because they do tend to walk quite quickly. So I tend to score my name on the top of mine so no, everybody knows it's Martin's BNF. Do not touch. However, um, if you don't want to spend that kind of money but you still need access to good, reliable medicines advice then there is an online version and it is free and you can access it from your smartphone if you want so i put the link there bnf.nice.org.uk backslash and uh, that gives you it gives you a lot of what is in the written version there's also of course the competency framework for all prescribers from the royal pharmaceutical society now you can find that online as well the original version of that was being worked on when we were actually working on the independent prescribing uh, situation as well on the prescribing board. And that was one of the things that I also worked on. Um, I see that there is a, a later version that's come out with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and I certainly wasn't involved in that update. Um, but yeah, that is a very, very good thing to have a look at, a competency framework.
The BNF tells you the name of the drug, the indications of the drug, the cautions, the contraindications, the dose, and the proprietary name or the other approved name. Plus, it does give you NHS prices of the drug, which might surprise you with some of it. Um, <clears throat> Section A1 of the BNF gives you interactions between drugs, so look for the pharmacodynamic interactions between drugs which have similar actions or receptor sites. So as we know, drugs work in a body by binding to a protein receptor or similar receptor on a cell. And sometimes you can have drugs that will compete for the same receptor on a cell. Um, a common one is um, if you have if you're taking a, a puffer for asthma, uh, salbutamol, that can compete with um, the receptor site for uh, propranolol, which is something that they use uh, as a beta blocker to uh, reduce heart action, to reduce you know, thumping action of the heart in hypertension. So drugs like that can actually compete at the same site. So that can be a nasty interaction with two drugs are being used without having thought it through properly. And then drugs can interact with each other as well. They can make a new drug in the body, or they can affect the absorption or the distribution of the drug, how the body metabolizes or excretes it, etc., etc. Uh, not all interactions, of course, are between drugs. So warfarin, for example, is uh, increased in action by cabbage, cranberry juice especially, and by glucosamine. I remember quite a few years ago now attending a attending a training course in a uh, hospital uh, run on haematology. And the haematologist there was uh, explaining when they'd had a warfarin overdose come in um, a few days beforehand. Now you can treat a warfarin overdose with vitamin K injections, if I recall correctly. Um, but this person had, had drunk literally gallons of cranberry juice for something, some other things, possibly a urine infection they got or something like that. And basically they just couldn't stop the bleeding uh, because it increased the action of morphine to such a point that by the time they got to the hospital they were too far gone. Uh, glucosamine and glucosamine sulfate, that can also affect it. And statins, particularly the older statins like silver statin, uh, they can be potentiated by grapefruit juice. So it's not always a drug that reacts with another drug. You'll find symbols at the back of the BNF. I don't think this is on the online version. But those symbols really, they're not of particular interest to us. They just tell us which drugs can't be prescribed by the National Health Service. And then you've got this wonderful bit. Once again, this is in the book itself. And this is the Latin version of prescriptions. Now, we're now told that we should always write our prescriptions in plain English and we shouldn't use Latin or Latin abbreviations. But I still think that there's a wonderful ring to equator di summendum to be taken four times daily, or quarta, quake, aura, every four hours. Um, but unfortunately, we don't tend to use it now. Um, although I have been known just on occasion to wind a certain pharmacist up, who I actually know very well by writing my prescriptions in Latin. It's the only use I've ever, ever found after all these decades for the Latin that they beat into me at school. But there you go. Now, finally, um, problems. Drugs can have problems. Um, the way to report a problem is to use the yellow card system. Now, you can do this online, or there's a yellow card in the back of the printed BNFs. And if you come across a problem, or anybody else comes across a problem, report it via the yellow card, or the yellow card link that I've put up there. It's not to blame anybody or anything like that. It's simply to add to the amount of knowledge on medicines. If there'd have been a yellow card system in place for thalidomide, for example, then that would have stopped the tragedy a lot faster than actually happened in reality. And anybody can use the, the, the yellow card system. It doesn't have to be a medical or health professional. It can be a member of the public. So there we are. That concludes this uh, short presentation. Um, thank you very much for your interest. Um, it is planned, especially while this uh, unfortunate situation with COVID continues for us to do at least one of these a week. Um, I believe it's been suggested next week for it to be a revision of local anesthetics. So um, hopefully I'll see you next week. Thank you.